Okay, uh, our last session before we break for, take a break for lunch. Uh, it is about, uh, you know, uh, how we cult can cultivate equitable and innovative uh, academic culture. We have three presenters joining us online, but to moderate the session, I'm requesting Rohina Anand to join, uh, the, to, to come to the dais stage. And very interestingly, our three presenters are from three different countries in Asia, you know, my neighboring countries. Please, in the middle. Yeah. Thanks, Haseeb. So, um, okay, I'm going to start off by saying I'm not very good at multitasking, so I'm going to be looking in different directions and hoping all goes well. And the last time I did a, a hybrid panel like this, actually, at one stage, all the screens went black. So, so hopefully that won't happen today. <laughs> Um, but I am, I'm aware that we are pre-lunch, but we do have a, a great panel for you to send you off into lunch. And I'm really grateful to our panelists for joining us live at what are some quite antisocial hours for them as well. But that is going to be uh, the benefit and the highlight of this really, is to get those um, local contextual perspectives and on research culture and the challenges facing researchers in doing their research, in publishing their research, as well as looking at the challenges, we're also going to go into the opportunities and what innovations uh, they have seen that have made their lives easier as well. So without uh, further ado, I am going to kick us off and say welcome to uh, Makoto Yuasa, who is the country director for Cactus in Japan. We have uh, Professor Hongliang Zhang, who's joining us from Fudan, and we have Dr. Rashna Bandari. So thank you all, thank you all again for being with us today. And actually, unfortunately, you weren't probably with us earlier on, but we, we did start in a, in a morning panel to think about some of those difficulties of research color, the culture that really, really impact researchers and their lives. So if I can start by act, asking Rashna to give her perspectives on some of those issues she faces in conducting her research and publishing her research, you know, looking at issues such as um, whether it's limited access to literature, whether it's high publication charges, whether it's language barriers. Um, we want to hear direct from you. So, Rashna, can I help hand over to you to start us off? Yes, uh, thank you, Rohina. First, let me just say uh, it is a pleasure to be able to access this meeting, even though it's remote. And I think that's one of the things that we will discuss later how technology has changed our ability to participate and contribute uh, and, and we don't have to fly around the world anymore to do that. Uh, but some of the challenges that you asked me to address, I have a few points here, Rohina, so I, I'll just go through them uh, one by one. Now, uh, I am based in India. I have been a PI for the last 16 years. And so everything I say is in some way uh, a collection of things that I experienced today as well as what I have been in the past as a PI. Now, uh, one of the things, of course, is the access to paywalled literature. And Indians are great at finding workarounds to everything. And in this case, uh, I, I know that it's not legal to use Sci-Hub, for instance, in many countries. But luckily for us, it's not illegal here yet. So uh, we are able to access a lot of things through the through Sci Hub, and I'm not the only one. Everyone I know in India does that. So it's been able. Uh, so we are able to get around the paywall that way. Uh, but if it's not on Sci Hub, it's a challenge to access for us. Uh, before this happened, and even today, institutions get together and try and get combined subscription to pay uh, to you know things that are behind a paywall. But invariably, we do not. We are not able to renew our annual subscription because the budget runs out, and we can't, you know, get enough money in time to pay for it the next year. So, so we lose access, or we lose access sometimes. If we have a 10-year subscription, we lose access to what was, you know, the 11th year on that, and that changes every year. 
Um, the other challenge we face in terms of access is, you know, if it's not paywall literature and, and it is an author pays setup, uh, the APCs are insanely high. Luckily for India, we are no longer a poor country and we are, we are sort of doing in the, you know, well in the mid income level, but our research budgets are still very, very tiny. Our research budget is still only 0.1% of our GDP and uh, sorry, point, I think, sorry, 0.7% of our GDP and which is not nearly enough uh, for us to be able to routinely pay uh, high APC charges. I'll give you one instance. So some of the very prestigious journals, the uh, APC charges can be on, at, to the tune of $5,000. Now that is one fifth of my annual consumables budget. I cannot bring myself to take money away from buying consumables for research and put it into this. And most cannot afford it, although there are a few prestigious elite institutions that support the high uh, charges because of the for the prestige journals, you know, because it's a it's a cycle there. Uh, now earlier, as I said, because we were a low income country, we were getting the waivers, but not anymore. Also, a lot of society journals have now handed over to um, to larger publishers, and then the the decision to do an APC waiver is no longer the editor's decision. It is the publisher's decision and the APC waivers don't come through for us anymore the way they used to about five, seven years ago. The other thing that we face is a peer review bias. Uh, we, okay, subconscious bias is a part of the human psyche. You can't do away with it. So we, we need to police ourselves to guard against subconscious bias, but that is easier said than done. We do experience uh, time and again an email address bias. And I'm sure there are other countries also that experience that. So if I send the paper to a journal where I have published before, I invariably get nice, uh, sensible reviews that target, you know, that tell me how to improve the manuscript. If I send it to a journal that I've never published in before, my address does not help me. It tends to bias many reviewers. Um, I don't know what the solution to that is, but it is a challenge that we face. Uh, the other things, of course, and this is not me personally, uh, but many people in India, uh, many of our students, for example, do not have English as a first language. They study it only from the sixth grade or the ninth grade onwards. So English language is an issue and somehow there's no culture of using English editing services in India yet because nobody thinks we should pay for it. So that, that is an issue that we grapple with. And uh, being able to attend meetings is still not easy. It's very expensive to fly. We don't have international travel budgets built into our grants. We do have funding mechanisms, so an invariably a student can once in their PhD tenure try and get some funding to, enter, to attend a conference, but one in five years is not enough for PhD students. But which is why a meeting like this makes it slightly easier for us to be more engaged. So those are the things that I have to say, Rohina, to the points that you asked in terms of challenges, and I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Rashna. That was, um, that was really good to hear your points directly and I'd, I'd like to pause there actually and ask for any any immediate thoughts um, based on what we've heard some uncomfortable truths there perhaps for us as publishers in terms of accessibility of literature um, any questions or thoughts from the audience at this stage any points that resonate Okay, let's carry on. But I'm going to I'm going to continue us on that theme of peer review in particular and peer review bias or bias or issues and challenges with peer review. So I'm going to I'm going to ask Hong Liang to to um, unmute and give us his perspectives on some of the challenges with peer review, but also some of the contextual and cultural challenges that he might face from the point of view of research culture and research assessment. 
Uh, hello, Rohina. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. It's very good, very glad to to be here. Uh, actually, I suppose I, I I really want to be you know the same room with you, but uh, due to some reasons I have to stay online. But it's still good to talk with you to uh, talk about the challenges we faced in China regarding the uh, publishing uh, this. So Rohina talking about the. Uh, uh, peer reviews. So I, I mean, for peer review, I think uh, the biggest problem I thought about is that actually it's not about for the so-called the good journals, high-impact journals. For nature science, or those journals, you we can always find that the reviewers are still willing to you know to review those those papers. But uh, for other uh, normal journals like elsewhere journals, there are so many. Journals and the number of publication. I personally, I know from China is increased by ten times in past less than ten years. In past, especially in my field of uh, uh, air pollution. Uh, so there are so many papers and people are doing the same things, and so you cannot. It's very difficult to find uh, you know responsible reviewers for for your paper. So I, I mean, so I worked previously in Louisiana State University in the U.S. At that time, I review like one paper per month. I got a request, and actually now every day I re I receive uh, you know three to five requests of review papers, and I'm not uh, excited about any invitation now. You know, so at the same time, I was a reviewer of. Uh, I was the editor of a, a, a couple of journal, journals, so I always have problems with the reviews, especially the people, uh, a, a manuscript from China really cannot find the reviewers abroad, uh, you know, from other countries. So we, and so when I finally found some reviewers, I, after waiting for like uh, one month, I received some comments, I feel really Bad, I feel bad again, you know, because uh, I didn't see very serious comments because the reviewers they, they, they are reviewing so many papers, so they are just given based on their first impression, uh, you know, when they making decisions. They just found some reasons, or they use AI, you know, to just write something and to show you. And uh, I feel the comments actually are not help, not helpful for me to do the judgment of uh, you know. Uh, rejecting the paper or uh, accept, uh, accepting that, and to the author, I believe it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, uh, very similar similar things. Uh, so, and that's one thing. And the other thing is that as still we have this, uh, uh, you know, uh, feel about you know, you know because your language is is not uh, your first language is not English, and the writing has some problem, and then. We still see people, you know, judge your your review, judge your manuscript based on based on language or which country you you are. I think uh, which country country uh, your manuscript is from. So sometimes we, we feel that because of maybe it's because of increase of the number of scientists, number of publications from China, it's overwhelming. So previously, U.S. is about 50 percent in you know publications. Ten years ago, now China is. Uh, Sixty percent. Okay. Oh. Uh, so people feel that uh, you know the manuscript from China is not good. Even a Chinese institute recently published a warning of uh, warning list of journals. You know, it point because there are the number, the percentage of Chinese authors are so high. So they said the journal is not good. <laughs> okay, a Chinese institute. So there are so many such of. of of things uh, uh, happen. So for other language challenges, like for my students in U.S., I have students. At least they learned, uh, they they passed their TOEFL exam. If they are international students, as for local, for you, for you know, domestic students, their 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 first language is English. But for China, everyone, you know, first language is uh, Chinese is not in English. So people they need to learn. And the students need two years to learn how to write, how to read, you know, get letter, you know, read uh, letter literatures to get ideas to know how to do that. And uh, we know that scientific language is English. 
so um, failed, failed, failed that challenge. So a lot of students, for most students, they actually graduated two to three years. So they haven't, uh, you know, feel the, the, that is the feeling that uh, I finally can read, uh, you know, a literature clearly, uh, they, they, they need to graduate. So sometimes we have to, but, and we also need, a, they needed to publish a paper to get a graduate. So sometimes it's also a problem because they can just write a very bad uh, manuscript. So the, and they need to graduate. So we have to use, spend money to do copy editing, to grammar check, to the language it helps. And that's actually, some journals also did a very bad things. They just ask you to provide a certificate that your manuscript has been proofreading by some institute. So they work together, you know, to earn, earn money again. <laughs> they already, you need about $1,000 US dollars to, to, to do that. Okay, I will stop here. I have so many things I want to, 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 to talk. Whatever stuff here. Thank you, Hong Liang. Thank, Thank you. So some nods on from the other panelists there as well on some of those issues that are resonating. Um, any comments from the audience at this stage or can't see anything at the moment. So I'm gonna move on to Makoto to give um, his perspective as um, country country director of Japan for cactus and kind of thinking about the research culture issues, the contextual issues for um, the Japanese community of researchers. Makoto, if I could pass over to you in terms of some of those challenges that are prevalent in the landscape that you see. Okay, thank you. Uh, and thank you for inviting me for uh, one of, as one of the panelists today. And, you know, I'll be quick because I think we are already in a discussion. So I think if now you can see India face, China face, Japan face, and but we are all in Asia, but Japan is in a totally different situation where India is growing, China has been growing, Japan has been declining. So that's a huge difference. And, and I think well, Japan is one of the countries where people are feeling, you know, okay, where will you go? And uh, that is what people are also discussing in Japan. So as a country director of Cactus Communications, who is providing English editing? Like, you know, just Professor Zhang just talked about the need for him to uh, provide a certificate of editing, which we normally take on, take care. So, uh, so I'm not a researcher, but I've met at least maybe 500 researchers in Japan. Uh, so I can just voice what they are saying. What is the problem in Japan? There are many problems, but if, again, if I talk so many, then it will never end. So I think I will cover uh, two aspects, funding and cultural stuff. So I think like maybe UK or some uh, US may be the same, but uh, uh, Japan used to have quite a lot of block fund. I think you, you call it block fund. So you know, it's like a fixed uh, budget that you can use for university management. Uh, and less competitive funds. But now, uh, every year, uh, block fund keeps decreasing, competitive fund keeps increasing, which means if, you, if you're a good researcher, or if you, if you have money, you can do research. But if you don't get money, you, you have, really you cannot do any research. And that was like original aim of uh, Japanese government is, okay, now if you, if you need to become competitive, you do, I mean, basically, if, you, if you're getting base uh, fixed salary with no bonus, maybe people are not motivated to do more work. That was the whole purpose of doing this. But what happened actually was uh, like you as a researcher spend most of the time doing research writing, hoping you will get research one. Maybe out of 10, you will get only one or two. So eight, out of 10, you just waste your time. So that really leads them to have less time to, to do research. That's one thing which they keep telling uh, that is the issue. And um, once, for example, once you get a competitive fund, which is three to five years, so it can never be 10 years, three to five years, then you have so much pressure to do research 
and to write papers because you know, then for, for you to get new a uh, new grant, you have to show, okay, I have done this research and these are a list of my uh, publications. Um, but as you know, Japan, you have less time, you have less money, you have less resources, you end up choosing not high impact journals because publication is more important. But you know what will happen, right? Because um, a lot of you are from publishers. So if you choose to go with not so high impactful journals, leadership, citation, or you know, download all will decrease, which will which will lead to even lower research evaluation in Japan. So so you know we are in a vicious cycle and and, and uh young researchers are really forced to uh, share their output in three to five years. So sometimes it will go uh, misconduct and, uh, you know, like some harassment by PI to young researchers to, you know, to just come up with some fake results and all. So I think this is what is happening from Japan in terms of funding. And if I can also add cultural aspects, um, so PIs, they have no fixed employment. So you can just, you know, you, if you, uh, once you become professor at, for example, University of Tokyo, you can just stay for long. No research, no publication, you are still stable. That's very scary. And young researchers, they always have fixed uh, employment. So even if you're good, three to five years, you have to find a new job. So. If I was a young student, I want to try many research. But if your PI, he gets a stable job who doesn't care about publication so much, then it's, I think for him, failure is more important than not doing anything. So what happens is PI is conservative. Young researchers are forced to, uh, to do more research, but of course PI has more power. So again, uh, maybe young researchers will end up just doing what your PI says. I think no, I'm not saying this is uh, it applies to all Japanese labs, but I think it, this kind of uh, culture still exists. So in, again, in the end, you become conservative. Even young researchers will conservative, and they will start saying, "Oh, our government policy is wrong. You know, Japan is declining, so it's okay." So I think these are one of the. Uh, there are many reasons, but there are a uh, couple of reasons why Japan's uh, research performance is not really up to how it should be. So, yeah, uh, Rohina, I think I will stop here. Thank you, Makoto. And I'm going to ask the other panelists as well if there's anything from each other's points that they want to pick up on before we move on. Doesn't look like it. Any perspectives from the audience at this point? Questions for the panel? Oh, we have one over there at the table. There's a hand up. Hi, uh, Tom Sharp, uh, Microbiology Society. Um, so uh, this is a question to all of you, really. Um, I think publishers are getting better at providing resources and training for early career researchers when it comes to understanding the publishing landscape a little bit. From your experience, um, what would you really like to see in this area and is there anything that we can be doing better? Thanks. Did everyone hear the question okay? So let me, um, who, put your hand up if you'd like to go first, otherwise I'll, I'll call on all of you, but Rashna, let's hear your perspective. So if I understood the question correctly, it is what can publishers do to introduce authors to the publication landscape and assist them in submitting papers that are up to the mark? Was that the question? There was a, a specific Peer and peer review, and there was a specific focus on early career researchers, so people who might be publishing for the first time in their research life. So, so I, I think publishers need to 
be a little more inclusive. Uh, most international publishing houses are based out of Europe or, or uh, the US, and I think that's a fact. And for countries like ours, uh, it is always as it's always thought that you've done better if you publish in an international journal. So if international publishing houses want to be more inclusive, uh, should they should set up more workshops uh, where where Asian countries can act, that Asian uh, researchers and authors can access. Uh, uh, international publishers should attend more local meetings in Asian countries. And the best time to have a workshop actually is for a, a few hours in the afternoon as part of a national meeting. Uh, so I have other suggestions that we can come to later in another section about what, what publishers can do to make things easier for authors. Mm -hmm. But I think giving us more uh, access to them, to the editors is, is important. And uh, a conversation between an editor and a potential author is so, so much more encouraging for an author than sending an email to an unknown face who is an editor. And that can be achieved, those conversations by editors uh, attending sponsored meetings and holding workshops for authors in countries outside of Europe and the US. Thank you, Rashna. Some really good points there about um, communication styles and how face-to-face -face has a place as well as just um, yeah, knowing who to speak to and having that named contact as well, it sounds like a communication channel there, really important. Hong Liang, can I get your perspective on what publishers, uh, what more can publishers do really to um, bring early career researchers into um, the, well, into publishing and, and what can they do to help early career researchers in terms of publishing? Yeah, I, maybe because that there are so many more and more new submissions to from China, and so I, from my as I know, every journal, all the, at, at least the, I paid attention to, actually they try the very really hard to help Chinese authors. So, for example, they have more and more Chinese uh, editors. So I I saw the uh, uh, data that. Uh, uh, there are actually 50% submissions from uh, China, but only 10% the Chinese editors. So actually all the journals are increasing, especially I know it's elsewhere journal and the AC, uh, RCS, Royal Society, RS journals, right, from UK. And they're trying to find the one more editor-in-chief. So you have multiple editor-in-chiefs, so you can have one from China. And so they are increasing that. And every year, a lot of journals actually, the publishers invite, the publisher first, they open their office in China. At least I know Tyler and Francis, ACS, uh, elsewhere, and uh, RSC, actually the Royal Society, you know, the publishing group actually sponsored one of my, my meeting. You know, that's why I know Cactus and, and I come to know you guys. <laughs> Well, they sponsored one of our meeting, and and uh, I invited their manager to, to give a talk in the conference to telling how they can help, what kind of service they provide, and they can help you to do. And uh, as this from Cactus, Cactus, they, they actually invited me for two uh, talks online to tell people how to, you know, for young scholars how to. Uh, you know, my topic is actually increase their international vision. So because I worked, I stayed in US for that means I like to travel a lot. So I have a lot of to talk about that. So I, I mean, they worked really, really hard to do those. And also, I know that uh, I have a friend in Tyler and Francis. They actually had uh, asked me to arrange a meeting for for the students from my university. So help them to 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 teach them how to be a reviewer, okay? How to be a, be a reviewer. And uh, after you finish their training, they give you a certificate and uh, they invited you to be a reviewer for their journals, okay? And uh, I, I remember at that time, we have 50 new reviewers uh, name provided to them. 
Okay, so the other things is actually a lot of journals each year I can see more than 100 uh, advertisements about the editors uh, in different University of China to tell people how to publish with uh, their journal. So how to publish high quality papers in their journal. And the most, of, the, of course, the most welcome is that the editors from nature journals. So, I mean, the, the journals, uh, I mean, really worked hard. They did a lot. Uh, to me, personally, what I expect more, uh, I don't know, maybe is uh, because of the, the high impact of journals, especially from nature, and their editor are not, they are, they are not scientists uh, to become I'm the editor. So like a lot of journals, uh, I'm the professor, I also be the editor in chief, I also the editor in charge of the, the paper. But actually for the, for uh, the nature journals, most of the editors, they're, they're just, uh, their full job is do the editor work. And I know one of, some of them actually just got their PhD, just with a lot, only a few publication experience. But now suddenly they can decide the big journals, nature papers. Nature paper maybe is not a big deal in other country, but it's a huge deal in, in China. If you can get a paper, you can get uh, 10,000, you know, Chinese yen or US dollar even resources to expand your, 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 your research. Not like, uh, you know, the case the market to talk about in Japan. In China, if you can have such big uh, publications, you know, the university, your institute, the, the funding agency, they will just give you money to help you to publish more because they feel anything published on nature is much more important than, you know, other things. Mm -hmm. So I feel uh, maybe some journals can help to have some professor, scientists from, you know, at least from China, India, you know, to be in their editor team or editor, uh, you know, advisory team. So they can provide some more professional journals. Nature journal, more, no, more and more people think nature and science journals, they are just, uh, you know, I'm not saying a bad word about that, but they are just trying to eye-catching. So they just want to publish something re regarding that. And uh, regarding so to get more citations or people will talk about more, not about the real case or even sometimes it might be wrong or misleading. So that's something I, I, I feel the journals can, can do in addition to what they already done. Thank you, Hong Liang. So, any perspectives from you, Makoto, based on the points you've heard? I mean, obviously, we've um, some common themes coming through around the need for training and actually what can publishers provide there, particularly around review, uh, the need for representation, uh, you know, on editorial boards, things like that, to make sure that, um, uh, yeah, from those perspectives. What, what would you say from okay. the Japan perspective, Makoto? Okay, okay. Yes, yeah, so I think uh, we are just talking about uh, what we can provide to early career researchers, right? So, um, there, uh, I'm, I know most of the publishers, mega publishers, are already providing a lot of tools on how to write research paper. And we also provide such uh, tools and uh, seminars, webinars, and all. So I think that is good enough. And if they're not willing to learn, that's their issue. What I think, uh, I, maybe there is someone from nature in this room, I guess. So if, like I said, I know many Japanese universities that are willing to pay so much money for nature master class because they want, you know, their paper published. Uh, in such journals. So, um, but if I talk about early care researchers, I think they just learn how to write, but how to make your research more attractive or how you can, uh, how, do, how do I explain, how, how, how you can convince your research in, you know, just a few, uh, pay, uh, in, in one article, I think that they don't know how. So if, if I think if, for example, as a company, if some publisher says, okay, let's do a joint seminar or webinar where you invite Japanese researchers and you 
you will provide a lecture on what peer reviewer will look at, you know, why this is important, what makes this paper not attractive, you know, so with some examples and, and typical mistakes maybe researchers tend to make, which they feel they're doing good. So I think these kind of uh, uh, lecture on how to make your paper more attractive it's something that Japanese are not good at. Japanese are so straightforward. They don't like to make good stories because they say, oh, no, oh, no, I'm not sure if this is true, so I cannot say it may be A, B, C, D. So I can only tell what I know. That becomes too, too boring. I think Japanese papers tend to be, be tend to be quite boring. So I think that, you know, maybe this uh, publishers can say, okay, no, you can say up to here, but after, after this, it's, it's a little too exaggerating. So I think that kind of tactics also, uh, along with how to make your research paper uh, attractive, is, is something that I think uh, publishers can really uh, uh, provide to young, uh, young career researchers. And I think we were just also about to discuss what publishers can do more, or they are doing what they are doing good. And one of the aspects which I think many Japanese researchers are, are happy about is, I think, transformative uh, agreement. Because, you know, they, they keep saying APC is just increasing. Now, uh, EN is very weak against USD, which means even if, you, if there's no price increase, you have to pay 20-30% more in JPY. Uh, so, but if transformative agreement itself you know, helps authors not to pay, or maybe you pay half, you must pay half. Uh, I think so, that is one thing which I think they enjoy. Apart from that, I don't know what research, uh, what researchers need, but again, Japanese researchers, young researchers, they need funding, they need uh, career stability, so, and how to write, like, well, how to write uh, better English papers. So these are three issues that Japanese researchers have and if publishers can come up with a possible solutions to cater to one of the or all of these issues, these problems, I think then this will be a fantastic uh, approach. So I think that's what I feel now. Thank, thanks Makoto. So Rashna, you've got your hand up. Did you want to respond to some of those points? Uh, yes, actually, I think uh, what Makoto said about transformative agreements is something that has been discussed in India for a while now and I think finally it was decided that it's just too expensive to to be able to afford this, uh, um, you know, for individual groups uh, of, of organizations. So there was a plan for a one nation, one subscription plan for India, which is, uh, you know, sounded very nice on paper, but it, nobody's talking about it anymore, which it's either gone into the deep freezer or it's in the works, but we all don't know about it. So we've come back to relying on, uh, you know, not on, on our friends and other ways to, to access literature. But here I feel that preprint servers have done us a great service. Uh, the more and more that researchers like us uh, post on preprint servers, the original point of preprint servers was to have discussion on your work before you send it for publication. It's actually become a repository to make your work public to your peers and protect your, uh, your, your privacy to the claim of the research. But it also serves readers in a very nice way and it just makes your research publicly available. So if you can't afford the, the gold open access, which is not mandatory in India, our funding agencies don't demand that we do a gold open access. So you put it into a green open access, um, but your work is still available for everyone to read on the preprint server. So I, I think that's been a way that, as I said, we're constantly finding solutions in India due to budgetary constraints and this has been one solution. But I do want to come back to another thing that more and more publishers can do to, um, to address the issue of, in, of bias. Um, and, and that is making your peer review public. 
a few publishers uh, such as embo had done that and and i think it's really really nice uh, because it prevents a, a referee from publicly saying things that are uh, not nasty and also um, it makes sure that the referees do a thorough job because whatever they say is going to be out there for everyone to see another thing that i saw very recently is um, is referees putting their name at the end of their peer review and if that can become mandatory although you always leave it the option to the referees so recently for a nature journal i saw that and also for another one i forget uh, but once a referee puts their name and their peer review becomes public then i i think uh, the whole issue of bias will disappear and i wish more and more publishers would seriously consider that as mandatory mm -hmm. uh, yeah those are my my suggestions to publishers thank you rashna and um yeah, that's um, great to see aspects of open science coming in there as well, um, learning how preprints are becoming more intrinsic to sharing of research and actually for access to literature as well, um, as well as you talking about um, yeah, published peer review, open peer review as well. Uh, I'm going to pause there for questions. I think there, uh, Haseeb, you were going to ask one before, but I don't know if there were others as well as we're now kind of onto the section where we're talking about opportunities for publishers and interventions that actually make researchers lives easier um, given all the other burdens they have to deal with i can't see any other questions but Hasib, did you Uh, I have a quick question to uh, Makoto and uh, Rashna. First, uh, both of, in both of your countries, Makoto, your, in your country, culture is a huge thing. Why we are now talking about publishers, seeking publishers' help? Why, wh how have we lost, actually, the mentor and protege relationship in research communication and research conducting research? Why are the senior professors, you know, how, why don't they actually work with or guide or mentor the young ones? So this is the question to you, Makoto, and for Rashna. The, our countries are developing so much economically. We are graduating from, uh, transitioning from, you know, uh, being lower, in, lower, in, lower income country to middle income, then looking forward to having, you know, high income status. But the investment in research, we are all talking about money. Money is not there. But there are money to build you know, railways, bullet train, this and that. Is it because we researchers are not strong enough to convince our politicians to uh, allocate money? That's why we are looking forward to you know, external entities like publishers to do something for us. Or we need politicians, sorry, researchers to become politicians and change the status quo. What is your thought on that, Rasha? Rashna, thank you. Makoto, I'm going to go to you first with that question. Did it? Did you hear that okay about the role of um, mentorship? Yes, yeah, sorry. Sorry, I couldn't understand it fully. Uh, so, Haseeb, the first question was around mentorship. Was that right? Uh, yes, but I couldn't understand the question exactly. So, yeah, why are the community... Um, you know, the, the Japanese community itself not providing those mentorship aspects, I guess, around writing papers, publishing research, all of those aspects. Okay, 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 yeah, thank you. Um, uh, so, PI, uh, um, so, like, I, I, I gave you two examples of PI. One is uh, one PI who is very relaxed, who is happy with whatever he or she is. So, they uh, they don't care actually. <laughs> I have you know it's not a good word, but they don't care what you know their students will be. But I will not talk about this bit because that's not that's a bad example. Typical PI will need to spend a lot of time writing research uh, grant, spending a lot of time for uh, uh, community within their university, or they have to do uh, because. Uh, each university is decreasing number of researchers, number of lectures, lecturers as well, which is not the case maybe in China or India, which means you know, whatever you are doing 
uh, last year. <coughs> this year you have to do more. So in natu naturally, many, many uh, clients that I've met, they keep complaining. I have to do education, I have to do research, I have to do grant writing, I have external commitments and all. And in the end, I have, I, I'm so uh, tired after doing this, so I cannot, I have little time and little energy to spend my time with mentorship. So that I keep hearing. So maybe this is a true story. So <clears throat> it's just, it just, it's not that I don't want to <clears throat> spend time just mentoring. It's about priority. I have so many things, <clears throat> so I don't have time to do mentorship. I think that's, uh, unfortunately, that seems to be the case mm -hmm. now. Thank you, Makoto. So Rashna, can I turn to you around Haseeb's question? Did you hear it? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I did, yeah. Um, so scientists are a pretty strong and respected community in India. And uh, we have been lobbying for quite a while for an increase in the, in the research budget, but it's not straightforward. Uh, there has, however, been a, a new body has been announced called the National Research Foundation. And this is likely to be quite transformative in terms of research funding. Now, the only thing is that the NRF, as it is envisioned in India, is going to get, the idea is to attract 70% of NRF funding through private or philanthropic sources. And that is something that there has not yet been a culture in India to support research by private organizations uh, where an outcome is not guaranteed. You know, it's, it's not delivering something. There's no money to be made in there. So I, I think this is going to take, if, 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 you're, if you're optimistic as I am, uh, you would believe that yes, there is going to be sometime in the future, we will see a transformation in the way that research is funded and in private donors being, you know, happy to donate to research without expecting anything in return. And, uh, and let's see if our funding goes up eventually and this plan is successful. But it will take a lot of effort on the part of researchers where we are used to sort of only convincing our peers, we will have to convince the public uh, and, and private donors to fund us. Let's see if that can happen. So that has been the response to our request for more funding. Let's rope in the private uh, donors. Thank you, Rashna. So other questions from the audience, final questions? For our panel, I can't see any. I have one for Hong Liang, actually. Uh, we've talked a lot about sure. what publishers can do. We have talked about international journals and how they have helped in some circumstances. But I, I want to know, with such a strong emphasis on China in domestic journals and that industry, what, what is your experience of publishing in Chinese journals, in domestic journals? Sure, thank you for the question. So the, for the China, because like uh, publication, publication is also like, uh, you know, a medium for the, you know, conflicts between China and the West countries. Like, uh, so the, the president of China, of China actually back to 10 years ago already said, you know, you need to publish your work in our, the word is said in our homeland, which means that you need to publish on Chinese journals. So Chinese journal included two types. One is, uh, you know, the English journal in English published by Chinese uh, uh, society, institute, or even government. And the other is like uh, the journal in Chinese. And our, of course, they will be operated by uh, all Chinese. So both journals actually, in China, I'm not going to say a lot about politics, but really the problem is that in China, you need to know people to do things. It's a country that uh, knowing somebody is more important than, you know, than, than, than doing something, you know, you know uh, serious. So, so sometimes it's very challenging to publish there. Even your, so we, for myself, my I have experience in U.S., so I, I like to publish the uh, international journals instead of domestic journals. 
But uh, because of what the Prime Minister said that we needed to focus on Chinese journalism, so when you apply for funding, so you have to have some papers published on domestic journals, domestic journals. So which means you have to publish, even you know it's more probably more difficult. Cut. You know, a lot of journals we have, uh, you know, article processing fees, AC, AP, uh, charts, APCs, but you also have like a sub subscription choice. Then you pay that money. But for Chinese Chinese journals, it's uh, actually it's for all the journals actually requires uh, a you know APC. Although it might be cheaper, but just like one thousand US dollars. But uh, every journal, you know. Requires requires that, mm -hmm. and they they give you one hundred dollars, uh, you know, uh, authorship fees to the corresponding authors. Okay, because it, uh, uh, so it's it's very difficult because uh, the Chinese journal sometimes uh, the journals in Chinese is different from the the, the writing writing is different from the international journals. Mm -hmm. So for me, like I just uh, graduate, I got my degrees from US, and I learn all the things in English. I sometimes I didn't know how to write uh, scientific papers in, in my own language. Okay, so, or at least I'm not as good as uh, in English. So I sometimes feel a lot of uh, uh, feeling about that, and also I didn't get any serious comments from the reviewers because, like, even the you. Internationally, we cannot find good reviewers for for journals uh, papers from China and for the Chinese journal. It's you know even worse the case. You can understand, right? So 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 that's why I don't really publish. I only publish the two papers in in Chinese actually, as out of my more than one hundred publications. Mm. But I, but uh, there are so many uh, universities not as good as Fudan University, uh, you know, and uh, every stu graduate students uh, need uh, a publication before graduation. So there are so large uh, market, you know, for those. And if you have heard, uh, I'm not sure if you have MDPI journals, you know, people here. But MDP, MDPI journal is actually journals are commonly, you know, treated as like printed journals, you know. So because they can publish the whatever you want, just by a lot, by you know, get money from 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 you. And I, I personally, I don't want to publish it there. But I'm not saying just my personal experience, uh, you know, ideas. I'm not saying bad things <laughs> about MDPI. That's an example. Okay. So, uh, so add, uh, so because so so there are so, so large marketers that regard that so the Chinese journal is the same, so they're still growing and uh, and, and a lot of uh, cases, but it's already difficult to publish on there. And uh, of course, if you publish on those journals, uh, you know no international, you know colleagues will read that, right? Mm -hmm. I, I didn't think I know that some young kids they're starting to learn Chinese because maybe at that time they some Ch learn Chinese as as your second language, but uh, scientifically I don't I don't think anybody can read the scientific you know journals uh, in Chinese. So definitely you lose uh, you know uh, you know people to to read your, your your paper from international. But it's important that uh, maybe the local government. You know, maybe the policymakers they will read that. You can get money, funding from because they read that. They maybe know you, and they you 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 can get the resources from 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 you know from them. Uh, but at least uh, scientifically, okay, I don't think that's very uh, helpful. Okay, but just my personal ideas. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> maybe too much about the politics and those other things. Thank you, Hong Liang. So, Russian, I'm going to really quickly move to you, and then we're going to wrap up. So, do you have a very quick point to finish on? Yes, uh, I actually have two, and both relate to uh, my questions to publishers. One to what Hong Liang referred to. What is the publishing community doing to address the scourge of predatory journals? And the second question I have for the publishing community is, 
what is your perception of the use of AI language editing tools as opposed to the conventional language editing tools that Makoto was referring to? Gosh, Prashna, so there's two big questions there to end on that we don't unfortunately really have time to address. I don't know whether the researcher to reader community could provide a forum for some of that discussion offline, but otherwise, Let's resume that discussion another time, perhaps. But I, I want to finish because we have, we have come to time now. So I want to give a heartfelt thanks to our fantastic panelists who've joined us at very late at night for some of them and in the evening. So thank you to Rashna, to Hong Liang, to Makoto. Thanks all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all.